Um, and we got this general idea that actors perform activities on objects, right? And that's, that's our general idea, and then we also have email addresses so we know who we're sending it to. Um, so here, Alyssa's server, um, she's sending a note to her friend Ben, and it happens over an HTTP post, you know, very simple, by looking up Ben, and then finding his inbox and submitting that to his inbox. Not too complicated. And we use the activity stream vocabulary so that we can mix up who the actor is, with what kind of activity, with what kind of object we're representing. And we have JSON LD that allows us to be able to do extensibility. Um, and why activity club though, right? So when I initially got involved in this, when, when we initially got involved in this, um, the Fediverse existed, but it was extremely fractured. We had all of these different social network applications that were trying to build a decentralized social network, and yet they couldn't speak to each other, right? They could only speak to versions of themselves. And we have these different compatible protocols. And so the W3C social working group assembled, and you can see me about 60 pounds lighter by the all this rest of activity club. Uh, um, and you know, various other people, including Amy, who is here, you know, and did an enormous amount of work, and Jessica could kind of work along with me. And actually, I, I don't have time to go through this list, so you'll notice I'm sure this is great for that. Uh, but the, but it, it was really um, three years of really hard work. And it wasn't clear in the process if it was going to pay off. And it has. You know, we now have this as a standard that we can all use to be able to speak to each other. And I think this is really exciting. Um, and I want to say that I'm probably the most visible face of Activity Pub, but I'm not the only person who has done Activity Pub. I'm not even the only editor, right? You know, Jessica Talent, who unfortunately couldn't make it here um, because she got sick, uh, is, a, is, is co editor with me. And there's all these other authors who are on here. And, and it's really actually, the acknowledgement section is really quite large. Um, and, and this is really a community effort. And that doesn't even include all the work that's happened since it became the standard, right? The community picking up and making it really into something that matters. And we're no longer so small, right? When we started the activity club, it wasn't clear if we'd be anything. And now, you know, I think the last time I looked, it was, I know it was over 2 million registered users, now that's not necessarily real users, right? But um, it, it's at least 2 million registered users, and it really does speak to how much is happening here. Um, three million. Three million. Okay, I'm wrong. And, and the last time I used to have a slide up here with all the implementations, and it was about 50, and now I can't even keep track. I don't even bother, right? You know, I don't even bother to, to add that slide anymore because I actually can't keep track of how it just happened. And that's incredible. So are we done, right? So one of the weird things about Activity Pub is when we were standardizing it, there were various things, especially around authorization and authentication where we didn't actually have the answers yet, so we left them as holes in the spec. And people have filled in those holes with what they knew, and they filled in some other things inside of, you know, the way that it's been implemented, and we had a number of responses that said, that's great, that's it, let's freeze the way that we filled it in, let's stop right there, and let's say, that's Activity Pub, and let's not try to move any further forward. So are we done? We can say that that's done. But I actually think the more interesting things are in the future. You know, that's a place where we solve today's problems, right? So what are those problems? So one of the biggest problems is that when nodes go down, users suffer, right? Um, they suffer in various ways. For one thing, all the content that they had access to disappears, right? And it doesn't only hurt them. The way, by having live HTTP-based hyperlinks, um, nobody can actually interact with that content anymore. Your old conversations now have holes in them, right? And that it hurts those people who are on the node, it hurts the community of people that they were connected to. And worse yet, the user that was on that node becomes homeless and needs to find a new home, right? And in searching for a node who a new home, they have to reconnect their network, and it's even a time of tremendous vulnerability because it's an opportunity for phishing. Who is that user that needs to be there? Where do you find your friend again? You know, if I'm your friend, I'm your friend, it could be a scammer, right? And maybe we're at the point now where that's not a very serious thing. But there will come a time where the, the seriousness, if we succeed, of our social networks means this is a very dangerous thing to happen, right? It's already a sad thing to happen. So one thing that uh, my friend Serge from Frosty and I have been experimenting on is something called data shards. Uh, here at Rebooting Level Trust, you know, we talk about this quite a bit, which we call secure distributed storage primitives for the web. And I mean that by that, by 
primitives to the web. I mean, they're the same way that HTTP and HTTPS are a primitive or live request response systems. Data shards hopefully will be a primitive or um, long lived storage primitives. Well, it could be long, potentially long, that don't live in a specific place. So there's two data shards uh, types of URIs that we have for immutable, unchanging content and immutable, changing content. And the way that we can use those is, uh, even if we just start with just immutable, if, since ActivityPub, this is one of the things that people said, we should lock it down to HTTPS only. But since we didn't do that, we could actually use data shards URIs and then it, and refer to it by that place. And one interesting thing is that the whole network can share the content. It's inspired by a system called Tableau AFS. And the whole network can share the content, but only the people I explicitly have access to can actually read the content. And that's really exciting. So you don't have to share it with everyone. You don't have to use that system. You can have a more directed system, but you have that option. And what's really interesting is that if you care about content, if you interact with that content and a note goes down, you could keep that content and continue to refer to it and it would have the same name. And it doesn't go away when the note goes down. But more excitedly, since we have a mutable one where we're able to change it, you have that after profile of the user. Since that after profile points at an inbox, when a note, if you, the user, control the mutable data shard uh, that represents your actor and points at an inbox currently, and that node goes down, you can just point it at a new instance. And then you can share that with the network. And the network can know and be able to survive nodes going down in a way that we can't today. And so that's why I'm very interested in this. So the other thing I want to talk about is breadth versus depth. And I'm talking about social breadth versus depth. And by this I mean, <laughs> Are we trying to be popular because popularity is the assumption that maximizing popularity as opposed to deep social connections about people we care about is the assumption that surveillance capitalist systems have provided because that's what they benefit from the most. But it's not necessarily what we benefit from the most. And whether you have a, how you, no matter how you feel about capitalism, surveillance capitalism, I hope everybody in this room has issues with. And here on Twitter, I am hovered over my own name, um, but I can hover over anyone's name. And what happens on here, on Twitter, is that when I hover over someone's name to get information about them, the, one of the first things I see that they put at high priority is how many followers do I have, right? And implicitly, without me wanting to do it, being aware of the problem, I compare that mentally to my own list of followers. And if I have more than them, I feel a little bit smug. If I have less than them, I feel a little bit jealous, right? And I am pressured into a game where I suddenly want to maximize the number of followers instead of having deep social connections. And here's Mastodon's web interface, and it's done the same thing. Now, is this because Mastodon wants to be able to assume these same surveillance capitalist-based assumptions? No, because this is what's familiar, and this is an easy mistake to make, because people, it's the lowest amount of work is to copy what you already know. And so I'm not blaming Mastodon's weather and face for exposing this, but I'm saying it has an unintended effect, and we should think about that effect. Uh, I also want to talk about spam and abuse and such things in our system. In many ways, these are all unwanted messages, and Sarah is going to talk about that more in his talk. But one of the things that comes up is, by adding filters, etc., are we, are we censoring? And I think this is a mistake, because there's a confusion. It's not censorship to decide to not listen to someone. It's censorship to not provide an avenue, to not allow someone to be able to find an avenue, to be able to create an avenue, to be able to speak. But I don't think that it's censorship that I choose to not read all the spam that comes into my inbox. I'm not censoring those spammers by deciding not to do that. So the complement of freedom of speech is a freedom to filter. And communities have the right to moderate and protect themselves. I think that this is very true, and the needs of different communities will be very different depending on which community it is. But the way that we've arranged communities in the Fediverse is, I think, broken. And the, in, in partly because the tools that we have are the only tools we've ever been taught to be able to deal with the problems in our systems. Um, and what we assume is the community is the instance. 
And thus, when we try to interconnect communities, we end up having problems because different communities have different needs and norms depending on what they're trying to solve. And this has one good upside, which is that it encourages people to set up new nodes because they're like, I have a community I care about, I want to set up a node, right? And that's the one good effect they have. But the other weird effect is that at the boundary of things, we end up with this kind of xenophobia that increases in our systems. Oh, I don't know, this other system did something that's a little bit off. Now sometimes people will do things that are incredibly off, and that's absolutely true, that's really a problem. But sometimes we see very small differences leading to enormous rates between communities. Um, and I think this is because we made a mistake. Where do communities live? Our assumption has been that communities live on the instance level. And I don't think that's true. We look at, can look at email to see why this is not true. In email, they don't assume that the social system happens at the, e at the instance level. Gmail.com doesn't tell you that much, nor does Hotmail.com, nor list.edu, nor anything. Um, to where communities live is on mailing lists. Mailing lists can live on all sorts of servers, right? And each one of those servers may have different moderation and norms. So Alice may live on one social dot example, and yet she may um, be connected to a mailing list on one server that says, oh, you know, this is my work, where I'm a math teacher, right? And another one where she, you know, for her hobby, where she writes fan fiction, and another one where she plays tabletop role playing games or something like that. And each one of these communities has different norms. And she behaves differently in every community. And she's not being duplicitous because this is normal, good human behavior. We need to support this behavior. And we made an incorrect assumption on where communities live, and that's the importance. Another thing I'd like to say is that I think that peer to peer systems may actually be a better way to client to server. We also adopted the assumption that client to server was the right way to go because that's where pretty much everything we've seen has gone. But on contrast, we can do things like, you know, maybe self-host at home, something that actually serves over a core onion service, you know, which punches your firewall, it doesn't really assume its location, and things like that. And in the 2000s, peer-to-peer -peer systems became really demonized by being associated with, you know, pipes. Right, file shit. You know, you're, 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 you know, you're, we're gonna punish you if you, you know, share files. But actually, social network systems can really benefit from peer-to-peer -peer designs. And file sharing is only one interesting thing that we can do with them, right? Um, so I want to talk about how we can go to some place that's much, way more interesting, way more out there, way more weird than we're currently doing. Something that proprietary social networks are not even touching currently but they will assume, and we can beat them to it. This is a mud. Who has ever played a mud or a text adventure? Raise your hand. Ah, so I think it's about, maybe about 60% of the audience. For those of you who have them, it's an old text adventure type game, but it's multiplayer. But what's interesting is that in some ways, our social networks today are degenerate versions of this, right? They've got more modern user interfaces, but on here you can talk with your friends. But you can also hang out with your friends at the bar. You can pay the bartender for a drink. The bartender will have you drink. You have it to your friend. Your friend drinks it, and their character gets busy and stumbles all over the place. Now that's the kind of interaction we don't even have. But could we have it? In 1985, this is Lucasfilm's Habitat on the Commodore 64. It's a graphical online multiplayer game in 1985 on a Commodore 64. And it's a social system where people are walking around and interacting with it. How can you do this on the Commodore 64? That's bonkers, right? And we can't do this on our social networks today. What's wrong with us, right? Um, well, I mean, I will say that a lot of smart people ended up working on this, so I'm not saying that we're, 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 we're foolish, but I'm saying this is an exciting opportunity. And in the 90s, before the web took off, a lot of the assumption was that the world was going to be a lot more cyberpunk, right? That we we're going to have these cool worlds that we go into and we do all these cool things, right? And this is a research lab paper about how we might build this kind of system, and it describes all sorts of stuff that kind of describes what we want to do already, and there are a bunch of things we've never talked about. And this is in the 90s. This is more advanced than anything we're thinking about today, or really talking about as a community, and this has happened before the web really took off. I mean, you know, it's not a web page, but this, this worked. 
really took off around that time. And I think that was really astounding. And how many people host an activity called servers? You know, quite a few. I mean, you can raise the hand if you want. But uh, what I really am more interested in is how many people host an activity called servers versus how many people host Minecraft servers? Kids host Minecraft servers. Kids self-host Minecraft servers. Why? Why can't we get kids to self host activity health servers the way that kids self host Minecraft servers? The reason why is it because Minecraft is the best graphics? Look at these graphics! Is it going to have the most amazing gameplay? I mean, the gameplay is pretty good. Is it because it's the most amazing fighting? I don't know. It's, it's because you can create together, you can build a world together, and that's thrilling. So I tried working on this with a couple of experiments a few years ago, and this was from a talk you could find on the ASIC website, where at the talk itself was the, 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 was the game was the presentation, and the rooms were the slides, and the, play, the audience was walking around the thing, and I changed the world while the, room, the audience walked around, and everybody had good fun. But I couldn't let the players change the world, because if the players changed the world, they would own my machine, right? They would ruin me, and I couldn't allow that. Well, I don't want to do that kind of stuff, and I kept searching around, where on earth can I find somebody who can do something like that? Because I don't know how to build that. I don't know how to even make this thing at that time. I didn't even know how to make this decentralized. Well, I kept thinking about it. Here was a little prototype user interface I put together, and I was like, well, you know, you can have a game tab here. You can have just a social tab here. Here's direct messages. You can have a browser that's actually secure but doesn't do as much, you know, and then we trick people into using a secure browser. But, you know, these are, these are interesting ideas that I was experimenting with, but I still wasn't sure really how to do it. And then I found this thing. Black Tech Community is not a tab. Yeah, that guy worked on that at one point. Uh, and in many ways, it was a successor to Lucasfilm's Habitat. You can tell, because Habitat's the name. <laughs> but it was a peer-to-peer distributed social game in 1997. 1997! And I'm like, where can I find out more? Where can I see it? Where can I run it? Where can I try it? And I found one video of it from 1997. It's got this guy staring at the screen. He's got this avatar, and he's dancing. <laughs> but this is cool! Everyone on the system can actually network, it's both a client and a server. And I'm watching the video, I'm watching the video. He's got this guy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he's got this guy. But there's all these cool and inter rich interactions, or at least they're saying so on the video. You can do this, you can do that, oh it's so cool, right? And, you know, I'm watching this video, oh my god, look at this guy. <laughs> but I kind of am not really quite getting exactly what I want out of this video, but, but if you're saying these things that I want, who do you think you are a coder? Do you ask us all the untrusted other people? That's what I want! That's what I want to do! How do you do this thing? Okay, you know, I'm watching the video. Okay, here, he's taking off his head. <laughs> he's selecting another head from his inventory and he's going to wear it. Let's put on the head. Ta da! What do you think happens next? <laughs> and anyone can make their own world. Anyone can make their own world and walk from world to world as walking through doors. Just walk. Enter this world. See my fine bar. Interact with things. Isn't it wonderful, right? And they had different terms of entry for different communities that were even programming in force, well, to some degree, there's only so much you can enforce, but it did enforce quite a bit. Here's this person. They want to put on a different piece of clothes. Can't put on that clothes in this area. It's not appropriate. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. 
sometimes. <laughs> but capabilities, object capabilities, you may have heard me talking about this recently. I was like, that's all they're trying to do. Oops, we ran out of dagger? What the hell is that? Well, it's this thing. But what does this mean? It turns out that there's this whole idea that having access to things, holding on to things, having a reference to things, is actually a more powerful uh, the security property than your identity itself. But your identity does come into play. Mark will explain that a bit more tomorrow. But here, Alice, we can think of this kind of like, Alice has the phone number of Bob, Alice has the phone number of Carol. Alice wants to give Bob access to this to be able to call Carol. So he called, Alice calls up Bob using this foo method and hands Carol the phone number. Now, I didn't show the whole thing. Mark will tomorrow. And now Bob has access to Carol. And this is, and it's like, oh, how do you apply to us? Social network developers, right? Well, it turns out this comes from sociology. Because Rana was a sociologist, and this is one of the most so famous sociology papers, and Mark stole the term. With permission. With permission. <laughs> but this is a grandmother diagram right here in the paper. There's a way more complicated grandmother diagram. Let's not unpack that. But you know, the cool thing is that we can think of security through our social connections, which is what we're building, a system of social connections. But that doesn't get me far enough. I read everything on the eWrite site, probably understood 20% of it, came back, well, okay, I understood 2% of it initially, but I kept coming back. Now I'm probably at 20%. Uh, but, so here's this cool paper that explains how to, be, to build one of these social networks in E. Highly recommend reading this paper. And you can do, it explains the fundamentals of being able to do a lot of the kinds of things that we like to do. So, I know at least I can build the system. We could all together. But it turns out, we're building social systems and we want to keep people safe. And this whole idea of handing someone something so they get access to it, turns out, this also works as in terms of giving someone consent to be able to do something. A lot of our work is about negotiating agency between two parties through consent. And we don't have the tools to do that right now. But capability, object capabilities can model about as much consent as we can model in a system. We can't model all of it, but we can model a lot more than we can today. And this paper tries to explain how we can use that for spam and harassment and etc. And Sarah will talk a little bit more about it. But I highly recommend you read the OCAP pub write up. I mean, I wrote it. So. Um, but the, uh, I don't need to do that song. But this is a phrase from the OCAP community that I think is almost right, it was actually wrong. Only prohibit what you can't prevent. Now, this is interesting because we actually can't prevent everything. Sometimes we pretend, though, that we can prevent things. You know, maybe the AP spec says don't federate a block, but we decide to anyway because we want to give the illusion that we're preventing things on the other side when we end up actually just inform people about um, who might want to harm us. That's probably not a great decision. But this isn't quite right, this phrase only prohibit what you can prevent, in my view. Because there are things we can't prevent in protocol, but we do want to prohibit. And it turns out we have other ways to be able to negotiate this and we can maybe sometimes enforce it. We can do it. We have legal tools and we can also kick people out if they're jerks. So here's a rephrasing. We must not claim we can prevent what we cannot. If we do otherwise, we could lose this risk. And there are conversations right now where people are saying, let's, in protocol, make it so that we can force people to delete messages on the other side. We'll force them. You can force someone to delete messages on the other side. It's mathematically impossible. We've proven it. So we shouldn't give people the illusion in our program that we can force someone to delete things. And if we do, someone may operate under the assumption that now I'm safe, but anybody who's ever interacted with someone using Microsoft Outlook, where they send a, oh, I regret sending that email, I'm going to delete it. And then another group of clients like, yeah, I'm not going to honor that, right? You know that that doesn't make any sense. It's not, we need to know what we can and can't do. At Rebooting Web of Trust, we were actually, um, there's a paper that's going to be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, Mark, Tom, Sarah, some others, um, and uh, I know I'm missing 
somebody who's in the audience, please raise your hand. Um, the, uh, but anyway, we, we were working on taking Mastodon's user interface and marking up everything that we thought was a vulnerability to users, and we're going to explain in this paper how we can transition towards something that's safe. By the way, how much time do I have? You've got um, wow, I'm doing really good. I can be really leisurely about this. So, there's all sorts of interesting things about this. Mark's going to talk about some of them. Some of them are kind of out there new, idea, um, new ideas for many of us who have never heard of them before, such as pet names. I'm not going to go into pet names unless in the Q&A somebody asks me to, in which case I have some time. Mark's also going to go into pet names. So. Uh, but we can make our systems more secure, and we don't have to throw out everything to do it. The changes that we describe in the system allow us to be able to make a few smaller changes to our systems and then make users more secure. And I really think that they can be very intuitive. Here's a really interesting one. Right now, Mastodon's user interface, when you want to do a, a private message, you click that little button and select the envelope, move it from a globe to an envelope. Well, we just, we just talked about it. We said we should really make sure that people's intuitions don't fail them. Because if somebody switches it, if somebody thought they switched it to an envelope, they might have thought they did that and they didn't actually, and they accidentally sent something public that they meant not to, right? And that is a form of insecurity because somebody's intuitions were violated. I mean, as Marcus pointed out, we can't escape from people's intuitions being violated all the time, but we should try to fail safe so that we do the least amount of damage when people's intuitions are right. So here's the suggestion we made. Instead of have two, people already have two intuitive modes for public-like things and private-like things. Twitter versus email. So when you switch things from Twitter mode, it looks like a Twitter interface for public things. When you switch it to private mode, it looks a little bit more like an email interface. There's a two line. And plus, now you can talk about people in your direct messages that you're not actually uh, Including in those direct messages, bonus. So, right, so these kinds of improvements can actually make our users much more safe. Now, this is a really interesting document. Uh, Sandra Hawk started it, and a whole bunch of people, including people from this community, contributed to it. And unfortunately, you can barely see it on the screen. But it's called Ways to Harm People Online. And Ways to Harm People Online is an interesting document that breaks up this whole thing into okay, you know, you can spam someone, you can send them harassment messages, you can do all these types of things, right? You know, you can, um, and, and, you know, but, and it turns out, OCAP, a thing that I wrote up, can mostly handle these first two columns, and that's pretty good. And if you even have, we can even actually improve some of these other things that we can't necessarily prevent, we can make better. We may be able to use some things to be able to reduce the amount of fake news and stuff like that. Um, there's some risks, you know, you might think of that as a trade-off, because if you're allowing people to comment and refute other articles, you might use that as a dog pile, you might use some tools as a community to discuss this. There are some things we can do there. But it needs to get a lot harder the further we go off towards this corner. And there are some things I'm just not sure we can actually prevent in our protocol. And that's troubling. And what I'd like to say is, yeah, we can do it. Right? As an activity pop author, I'd love to say, yeah, we can do it. Because I would like to feel that way as a person who's building this protocol. But I'd be lying to my users, because some of this stuff is mathematically impossible to prevent. We know it. We shouldn't lie to our users. That will increase their danger. So what can we do? Is there nothing we can do? I'm going to take a little diversion. Who here knows about Conway's Game of Life? Raise your hand. Okay. Good portion of the audience, but not everyone. Um, Conway's Game of Life has a few simple rules, and you kind of put up these squares, and depending on how many other squares are near each other or not, they might reproduce, or they might die, right? Like little sets. But what's interesting is if you just take your mouse and you just drag it back and forth across the screen and you press one and you just leave it for a while, a bunch of these patterns appear, like, almost all the time. They just keep appearing. Why do they keep appearing, right? Like, we didn't specifically plan to put this thing here. Why does it keep showing up? It's kind of strange. This is called emergent behavior. We didn't necessarily put it to the core rules, but it grew out of the core rules. Well, that's interesting. Who here has played Risk? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. Well, people who have played Risk, who here 
has experienced people stop talking to each other after games of risk? Please raise your hand. Yeah. Me? Yeah, actually, it's about 50% of the audience who raised their hand the first time. Nothing in the game's rules say stop talking to your friends afterwards. <laughs> and yet the rules somehow leads you to lead to this. I mean, it's like, also nothing in the rules says you can't backstab your program. They can bring them with them and then cut them by the neck the next moment, right when they thought they were safe, right? People got really hurt by this. And Morgan and I actually can't play competitive games. Morgan and I have only had three really serious fights in our life, and two of them were over scrap. The first one was the first month into our relationship, and I almost ended it. The second one, I got a small soft cover, but still a dictionary thrown at my head. And we just don't play competitive games. Um, and Morgan put it pretty well. She said, well, I'm a sore loser and you're a sore winner, so we can't play competitive games. <laughs> Nonetheless, I still like to play risk for, for some of my friends and not talk to them for a while. But there are games we can play. Here's one called Pandemic. Who here has played Pandemic? Raise your hand. Yeah, actually quite a few. So Pandemic looks so well like risk if you're just looking at the board, right? You know, it's not a map. It's got these connections between them. It's got little pieces that move around the map. I mean, I guess, you know, most games with Earth on them do. But what's kind of interesting is, in this game, you're cooperating together to try to prevent an outbreak of disease. And if you don't collaborate together, the world will die. And at the end of almost every game, even when the world dies, most of myself and my friends hug each other for how hard we work together. And it's like, there's nothing in the rules that says we should hug each other at the end of the game. And yet, somehow it seemed to flow out of the rules. Emergent behavior. Now maybe we should add a rule to it that says, you must hug each other. If you don't hug each other, you lost the game. But for some reason, encoding that specific rule takes the magic away. You might resent hugging the other person. There is something valuable about that emergent behavior. But this is really hard, because what rules result in hugs, and what rules result in your friends not speaking to each other for weeks? Well, one way we can figure it out is just make a lot of games, right? And use, like, evolution, and eventually we'll figure out which ones are good, which ones are bad, and maybe we'll just, we as game designers, and we, Fediverse authors, are game designers, whether we think of it or not. We'll just generate a bunch of rules, and some will survive, and some will die, and some of them, you know, might result in you know, the presidency of Donald Trump. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just figure it out as we go. But there's another thing we can do. People sometimes ask me, hey, Chris, what's your favorite programming com uh, podcast? And I say, oh, Doodology. And they look at it, they're like, this is a board game design podcast. And I say, that's right. And that's because, you know, you can see right here, here they've got a classic game tech episode where they're talking about information theory. And, and most of these episodes are talk of game designers talking to game designers. And what's interesting is these patterns show up in our programming systems too. But they don't show up just when we write the rules while we're writing them. They show up in the results as well. So we can think about what kind of patterns have we identified so we know what kind of behaviors may emerge from them. This is actually something we can do a little bit towards that top right. We can a little bit shift people towards different kinds of behaviors by observing what kind of behaviors come out of our rules. But not completely. I'm not sure you can completely ever prevent something like 8chan having people on it deciding to commit genocide. Right? Arguing for it. Well, can we do something to help a little bit? You may be wondering, okay, I'm not going to advocate everyone switch to Emacs, so that might be nice. Um, I'm actually talking about myself as a young person who felt lonely and lost at times, and very beaten up by the world. I know now today there are other people who are more beaten up than myself, but I did feel lost. But well, something that's interesting is I started programming and I discovered this text editor, Emacs. And if you played around enough, just through the interviews, you might accidentally end up reading Richard Stallman's philosophy. And Richard, Richard Stallman may sometimes not always treat people nice, but this philosophy has actually really guided the community and also myself, and led me to an interest in philosophy and human rights. 
And that's very interesting that this program included this thing and taught me something, right? I can imagine a path in my life where I could have split and become a very angry person who felt powerless and wanted to take that out on other people. But instead, I found another path where I decided to devote my life to human rights and to give freedom of everyone. We can do things to guide people in the right direction, even if we can't prevent everyone from going in the wrong direction. So we can provide a guiding philosophy. Imagine if we build this interactive virtual world, and when you spawn into the world for the first time, your avatar comes with a default inventory, and in there is a game manual. You're reading the game manual about how to play the game, and not everyone will read it, but even the people who don't read it will be influenced by the people who do. And in those rules, you happen to bump into some philosophy about how we should treat each other, about how we should think about the world. Well, I've been searching for that philosophy for a while. Here's a very good one, the Declaration of Human Rights from the UN. And it's not actually necessarily enforced directly by countries generally, but it does guide the kind of things they enforce. And it kind of guides actually individuals and people like myself to change the path of our lives. So I'm actually going to advocate for a philosophy here that I've been workshopping. You know, does Chris Weber have a novel project? I don't know. How about I work on a philosophy ethics framework in the background you know, for a while? And you don't have to subscribe to this, but I think it's an interesting basis to start thinking about this community. What if we work on maximizing agency, not just for ourselves, but for ourselves as well, but also for you and for everyone? And this has an interesting dual pressure effect because we need to make sure that everyone has agency. But agency means that we can't do it so much that individuals don't actually get to make choices because then it wouldn't be agency. To be an agent, to be an emergent consciousness in this universe that explores the space and time we live in, which makes decisions, is one of the most amazing things that exists in our universe. And we want more of it. And we want to protect the agency of agents that are in it. Maybe even for agents we've never seen before. Um, you know, we don't know where technology is going to take us. It's a little bit science fiction, but you know, I think about such things from time to time. But also, we really need to keep things fun, right? You know, playing in the snow is a great way to have fun. Building social networks can be a great way to have fun. They can also be really stressful, right? Using social networks can be fun and it can be stressful. But you know, keeping fun in the system, keeping it in mind, is actually really important. Because I'm going to be honest, even though I'm saying we should provide a set of rules and principles, we won't win on those grounds alone. And this saddens me sometimes when I say it, but then it hardens me when I think I can build a cool, you know, interactive fiction world, right? But what's, what's interesting is that. Or, or maybe, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but most of our software will not be picked up by people who are philosophically motivated yet, but they may become so. They'll pick it up because it solves a need of theirs. And fun is something we all need in our lives, implicitly everywhere. Everyone discovers this. Even the people who try to make things as sterile as possible eventually discover that they have to change the workplace environment of their environment and make things more interesting. Fun is important, and we need to have it. Well, look at some image credits. I think I put them in the wrong place. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's supposed to be the end slide. I've made a lot of changes to my slides for the last moment. There is one more slide. So when I was working on Activity Pub, and also when I've done things, when I worked in Creative Commons, I got hired and I started doing some licensed things, people started taking me seriously about these things. I wasn't trained in the university. I'm not actually a university trained computer science. I picked this stuff up because I thought it was interesting, because I wanted to build games. Um, and I said to Bradley Kuhn, who's a friend of mine, you know, well, I don't know why anyone's taking me seriously. I don't really know what I'm doing. And he said, revolutions are won by the people who show up. And I thought, that's so smart. Well, then I found out that nobody actually knows where this phrase comes from, but it didn't come from Bradley Kuhn. But it's a great phrase. And I'm glad that he shared it with me. So I'm going to say to you, have fun at Activity Pub Conf. You showed up. Welcome to the revolution. Before we 
we take questions, I just want to say real quick that um, that uh, I originally gave the demo version of this talk to um, a group of friends who are very technically minded, and they said, this is not a good keynote, and I changed a lot. Because originally I described all the technical ways in which we were going to solve things, and I'm not going to do that on here. You can read the papers, you can also subscribe to this podcast that Serge and I run called Libre Lounge, and it really distills a lot of ideas. Yeah, we're a podcast with an agenda. Agenda is freedom, right? So, um, I encourage you to listen to it. Um, if you want, you can also go to my website and read some of my blog posts that I don't update enough. And you can also, you know, give me money because, you know, we, I'm desperately trying to fund my own work very often, right? You know, but I like to open it up to Q&A. Um, does anybody have any questions? Use the microphone. Uh, yes, we have a microphone for questions. I will start out being the one that hands out the microphone, but actually I will hand it to Manu, who will very kindly hand it out the microphone. Thank you, Manu. Thank you. Does it work? Yes. Uh, wouldn't uh, you say that uh, maybe peer-to-peer would be better suited for uh, social media? The first thing that came to mind is that right now there is a kind of moderation which is done by people that have actually took the responsibility they said that I'm, I'm fine with doing moderation. And I think that is the reason that uh, definitely works. Not everybody who has an account wants to have to uh, ensure his own safety by blocking specific people. Okay. So if we go peer to peer, what's that difference? And how do we solve the problem that, uh, that we have with GAP, for example, that says that yeah. everything is allowed? Because yeah. if everyone self posts, actually everything, everything is allowed. Great question, great question. So, I said before that I thought that instances were more community level, but I didn't say that there were community levels. I said they were in a different place, right? So, but there's really two things to your question. One of them is not everyone wants to host their own servers. And A, we can make it easier for everyone to self-host. We can do that, and actually client to server is one of the reasons why it's harder to self-host, and we can make it easier. But you know, the other thing you said is that not everyone wants to moderate. Well, I really have a couple of answers to that. One of them is we can make add tools in place, and I'm trying to describe them in the OCAP hub, that actually make it so that it's harder for people to actually get abuse to you. I'm not going to go into detail on them right now, but I think it's possible to build those tools. But the other thing that's really significant is that I'm not saying that we don't have community moderators. I'm saying that communities aren't on the instance level. Email mailing lists tend to have been community moderators, right? They're not complete free-for-alls, and the moderators behave differently depending on the needs of those communities. So I'm saying we still need moderation, and we still need anti-abuse tools, absolutely. We just made a mistake by assuming the instance is where it happens. And I'm not saying an instance administrators won't do some things sometimes, but I'm saying that we currently think that that's where it happens, and that's a mistake. And it's breaking our infrastructure. And we can do much better. Thank you. Thanks. I'm learning a lot these days, and one of the things new that I'm learning is that not everybody uh, uh, sees fungible currency as a way to reward uh, creativity in like a game environment or in a generative sense for moderating what we do. And I'm, uh, I haven't been able to figure out what whether we do need tokenization of value or not in order to, and how that would work, in order to bridge these worlds that right now is to make my head spin in a gold private equity funded world, which I'm trying very hard to believe, uh, the tokenization. 
social networks can survive without payments, and payments can't survive without social networks. Are blockchains the right answer? I'm not actually as convinced as many other people. I do think that blockchains may play a smaller role than many people are currently arguing right now. But one of the other things that we did the rebooting of the trust community is to working on is verifiable credentials. And those are ways to be able to say X is Y about Z. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound very interesting. But then it gets more interesting when you say your diploma says you have a computer science degree, right? 
Oh, oh, ah.